Along the dusty, rutted country road, a young pregnant woman trudged slowly on her way to term. She panted, one hand supporting her enormous belly, the other rolling a large wheeled bag along. Sweat covered her face, rolling down in large drops, her hair sticking to her body. Maggie wanted nothing more than to reach her grandfather's house, yet there was still a long way to go. Completely exhausted, she leaned against a crooked fence and breathed heavily, as if she had just run a marathon. The merciless sun beat down, and all she wanted was to collapse onto the damp earth and not get up. Suddenly, the sound of a motor behind her and an old UAZ pulled up beside the woman, braking. Get in, I'll take you wherever you need to go. What on earth possessed you to travel in your condition? In this heat? It was Uncle Darrell, an elderly farmer. He squinted at the traveler and then slapped his forehead, removing his cap. Maggie, is that you? I didn't recognize you at first. My goodness. Married? When did that happen? It feels like you just left a year ago. Decided to visit your homeland? He bombarded Maggie with questions, but she felt so nauseous that she didn't want to answer them. Yet, she had to. Hello, Uncle Daryl. Yes, I decided to come back home for good. I don't have a husband anymore. It's a long story. Could you take me to Grandpa's house? I can barely walk. This belly is killing me. The man scratched his head and shook it. Well, well, what a turn of events. And how will you manage there all alone? Judging by your belly, you'll be giving birth soon, won't you? And once our women find out you've been wandering around, they'll chew you out alive. They'll tear you to shreds. The woman sighed heavily. I know, Uncle Darrell. What can I do? I'll manage somehow. I have nowhere else to go. I'll register at the medical station here. I'll get used to it. The man drove her to the house and waved goodbye. Well, goodbye, Maggie. Make yourself at home. If you need any help, just whistle. We'll help you out as neighbors. Surprisingly, the rusty-looking lock gave way easily, and Maggie entered the house. She dropped her suitcase in the hallway, sat on the edge of the couch in the room, and looked around. Everything here was just as it had been in her beloved grandfather's life. Their portrait hung on the wall, a horseshoe-shaped talisman above the door, an old embroidered blanket made by her grandmother. And there was dust everywhere. She'd need to clean for a week. And such sadness overwhelmed the woman. Tears rolled down her cheeks, a flood of memories of her youth and recent days merging together. Maggie's parents died when she was very young, only eight years old. They both worked on the farm, her mother in the greenhouse, her father as a herdsman. They lived modestly but harmoniously. They had their own garden and a small farm. But a tragic accident took many lives. A short circuit on the farm caused a fire that spread quickly with the hot summer wind, engulfing a handful of frightened people from all sides. The chances of survival were slim. Suffocation by smoke did its job. So, eight-year-old Maggie suddenly became an orphan. Her grandfather and grandmother began to raise her, replacing both her father and mother. The girl grieved deeply for her parents. She missed her mother's tenderness and love, her father's care. The house immediately felt empty, orphaned. But her grandmother, unable to bear such sorrow, soon fell ill with high blood pressure and heart problems. And a month later, she was gone. So, the girl was left with only one dear and close person, her beloved grandfather Ben. He didn't like tender affection, but was strict, yet he loved his granddaughter very much in his heart. He raised her as best he could, as if she were a boy. He taught her to handle a hunting rifle skillfully, to mow grass, to saw and chop wood. 
The girl rode horses skillfully and even knew how to hammer nails herself. Maggie loved her grandfather, but she secretly dreamed of one thing to leave for the city. Almost all young people did the same, as there was only one path here, either to become a dairy maid or a pig farmer. And Maggie wanted so much to see how city dwellers lived. Television showed cozy apartments with amenities, theaters, entertainment. It was so enticing. It seemed unbearable to her to spend her whole life in the village, such hopelessness. But when Maggie, immediately after graduation, began to pack up and persuade her grandfather to let her go, he was furious, stomping his feet and angrily shouting, Where do you think you're going, Maggie? What city? You need to study, get some kind of profession. Go to the district center, finish cooking courses. Maybe I'll find you a job at our canteen. You'll always be fed and the work will be easier than on the farm. And maybe there, we'll find you a good husband. Just like everyone else. Well, what's wrong with that? But Maggie insisted, repeating her point. Grandpa, don't be angry, let me go. I'm grown up now, and I'll go work in the capital. I'll find a city guy for myself, I don't need these village men. I want to live like a white person. You'll see, everything will be fine. Well, I don't want to stay in the village, understand me, finally. Ben was furious. I swear, if I had a switch right now, I'd give you a thrashing. Who needs you there, you fool? Where will you go to work? You'll end up messing around and engaging in debauchery, know that you're no longer my granddaughter. Shame on you. Ah, if your mother were alive, may she rest in peace, she would definitely talk some sense into you and set you straight. How can't you understand, silly girl, that in the village, the very land feeds you? Just don't be lazy, work. And in the city? It's all just hustle and vice. Why bother talking to you? Stubborn, just like your father. Do as you please. Maggie still didn't listen to her grandfather and left. And even though he gave her some money for the road, everything he had, he was still very offended by her. He had hoped that his granddaughter would stay, become his helper. Start a family, have children, and they would all live nearby. But everything turned out not as he had hoped. The capital shocked Maggie, overwhelmed her. It was like a huge anthill where everyone scurried back and forth. No one paid attention to anyone else. Cars zoomed by at terrifying speeds and supermarkets lured with beautiful displays. The girl felt like she had entered another world and was constantly amazed. How could this compare to her village where everyone knew each other, where there was only one store for the entire district and the only entertainment was the club on weekends? The girl firmly decided to settle in the capital for a long time, not to disgrace her grandfather and to live conscientiously. So, as soon as she arrived, she rented a room on the outskirts, the landlady lived next door, an elderly grandmother. She critically inspected the new tenant and sternly admonished her. Listen here, girl, don't bring any suitors here, don't make noise late at night, and behave decently. Otherwise, I'll find another tenant in no time. Maggie decided to please the grandmother and handed her a jar of pickled mushrooms. Oh, don't worry, Mia. My grandfather raised me himself. He's strict, you know. He didn't even allow me to stay out late. So, don't worry. I didn't come here for entertainment. I came to work and make a life for myself. The old woman smiled peaceably. Oh, thank you for the treat. Well, let's go to the kitchen then. I just boiled some potatoes. We'll have dinner. Yes, I see that you're not spoiled yet. Yes, the city life changes everyone. That's why I'm warning you just in case. Maggie settled into her new place and started looking for work. That's when she encountered problems. 
She didn't want to be a waitress because she'd have to work nights. And her landlady had made it clear that she shouldn't wander around at night. She was also wary of dealing with money. What if she made a mistake and then they blamed her for the shortage? So, she took a job as a cleaner at a small private company. The schedule was convenient. From 8 to 5, it suited her. Being a naive young girl, she decided that if she showed diligence, she might be promoted to a better position later on. Maggie was given a nice uniform, and she started her duties. All the equipment was modern. The work, overall, wasn't hard since all the premises were covered in laminate and tiles. The girl looked enviously at the young co-workers her age, who worked at the keyboard with manicured fingers and chattered about fitness clubs and updates. She dreamed of saving up some money and going to school herself. She couldn't spend her whole life scrubbing floors, after all. Maggie had a very attractive appearance, a fiery bright brunette with black eyebrows and long curly lashes, brown eyes, and a charming smile. Yes, and she loved to socialize, so she quickly integrated into the team. They didn't tease her. On the contrary, they praised her for her hard work and called her the fairy of cleanliness, trying not to use the offensive word cleaner. Especially swirling around Maggie was the head of the purchasing department, a young guy named Nicholas. He complimented her and hinted at a date. He had a reputation as a ladies' man, but Maggie didn't like him at all. He seemed slimy. His eyes kept wandering, and his oily jokes only irritated her. But she didn't openly refuse him. After all, she didn't want to ruin their relationship from the start. So, she politely and playfully brushed him off. But the man was very angry and took her rejection as a personal offense. How could this be? Some cleaner dared to refuse him. The company's director, Morgan, also observed all this but didn't take it seriously, dismissing it. His subordinates were having fun, and that was okay, especially since the owner of the company had bigger problems. After all, the income had been falling lately, although there were no visible reasons for it. Nicholas wasn't even his close friend, they just studied in the same department. They often crossed paths, but they were too different in nature. If Morgan was always calm and dignified, then Nicholas was a real playboy. Not a single skirt had escaped his attention since his student days and there were rumors that he liked to gamble away money at casinos and on horse races. Nevertheless, he was a decent specialist. He knew how to buy cheap and sell deer. And when he asked for a job with Morgan, he took him without hesitation. The business had been passed down to the current owner from his father. It was a small but firmly established company involved in developing and selling software and even computer hardware. They had a team of young, promising specialists capable of creating their own original products. Morgan, like his father, loved his work and managed it skillfully, striving to encourage employees for their creativity and new developments. And he paid them decent salaries. So, he couldn't understand why the company's revenues had been declining over the past month. What was going wrong? He hadn't yet informed his father about the problems, as they weren't critical yet. He wanted to figure it out himself. After all, he had completed an economics degree for a reason. Once, in honor of the new year, the director decided to organize a corporate event. He booked a restaurant and invited absolutely everyone, from the management to the security guards and receptionists. That's just the kind of person he was even though he had money. He didn't divide people into rich and poor. It's rare to come across such people nowadays. Maggie was very happy because she was the only one who was afraid to go out in the evenings and hadn't made any friends yet. And here such a celebration was planned. The only downside was that she had nothing to wear. She had to spend a lot of money to buy a new dress. Mia's niece gave her a beautiful hairstyle and lent her some cute high-heeled shoes. When Maggie entered the restaurant, took off her old coat, 
changed her shoes, and entered the hall, everyone gasped. Such a delicate beauty. All blooming and fresh. The colleagues were used to seeing Maggie in uniform and now admired the girl. Even the director couldn't take his eyes off her. And Nicholas immediately perked up and started flirting with Maggie again. But the girl dodged his advances once more, but she agreed to dance a slow dance with the director. It was so wonderful. Disco lights, music flowing, and they spun, spun. Maggie's heart was ready to burst with happiness that suddenly overwhelmed her. She really liked Morgan, but she didn't dare to dream about him. Who was she, and who was he? And now Morgan was looking at her like that, intently, warmly, her legs even trembled. When everyone started going home, the director suddenly suggested, I'm going to the old town. Anyone on the way, hop in, I'll give you a ride. Several colleagues got into the car, and Maggie was among them. It was in her neighborhood. She was glad she wouldn't have to call an expensive taxi. After all, it's dangerous to walk home alone in the middle of the night. Morgan dropped off his colleagues one by one, and it turned out that Maggie was the last one left among the colleagues. Everyone else had already gotten out. She timidly said, Stop here for me. We've arrived. Thank you so much for the ride, Morgan. The director walked around the car, opened the door, helped the lady out, and didn't rush to let go of her hand. Their eyes met, and they both immediately understood that they were lost. A spark seemed to pass between them. Morgan began to speak to her softly. Sweet Maggie, my sunshine, after dancing with you, I can't come to my senses. I'm crazy about you. I've fallen in love like a schoolboy. It's even funny. Tell me, do you like me? Would you like to meet again, just the two of us? Maggie's throat dried up in an instant, and her heart pounded like crazy. She wanted to shout to the whole world. Foolish, I've been dreaming about this. But she just nodded quietly and looked at him in such a way that everything became clear without words. The couple began to passionately kiss, without planning it, just following their instincts, and both flew to the seventh heaven of happiness. Since that evening, they started secretly dating. At work, they still maintained their professionalism, but in the evenings, they burned with love and passion. And of course, naive Maggie decided that this was her one true love. The prince she had dreamed of since childhood. She immediately forgot her grandfather's words and cherished her love. But you can't hide a needle in a haystack, and soon rumors began to spread in the team that the boss was courting the cleaner. Many envied her and openly didn't understand what the director saw in her. Just an ordinary country girl. Maybe a bit cute. No one took their romance seriously. Everyone understood the boss was just having fun. Soon he would get tired and ditch the fool. After all, it was clear as day that there couldn't be anything between them. Nicholas was particularly furious. He began to hate this audacious girl who openly rejected him but jumped into bed with Morgan. And he decided to get back at her so she would know her place. But all these conversations seemed to have no effect on the lovers themselves. Maggie was floating on air. She loved her sweetheart unconditionally and was eager for a quick wedding. As for Morgan, he hadn't initially planned on getting into a serious relationship. It was just light flirting, nothing more. But he didn't realize how captivated he became and fell in love. So much so that he couldn't go a day without his Maggie. She was extraordinary, so lighthearted and cheerful. She demanded nothing from him except love. They truly enjoyed each other's company. And the fact that Maggie was just a cleaner didn't bother Morgan. He decided that after they got married, his wife would stay at home, tending to the household. However, the procurement manager disagreed and began plotting against the young couple to break them apart. 
He first planted important documents in Maggie's bag and caused a scene, persuading the security guard to search her thoroughly. Maggie was called in, scolded for appearances' sake. But Morgan brushed it off, thinking it was some misunderstanding. Why would Maggie need contracts anyway? What would she do with them? It was just ridiculous. She didn't understand anything about computer development. She couldn't even sell them smartly. But Nicholas wasn't laughing, so he took countermeasures. He met with Morgan's influential businessman father, Carl. Carl was very surprised by Nicholas's visit. Well, hello, Nicholas. What brings you here? Did you decide to visit the old man or something happened? I haven't been sticking my nose into my son's affairs lately, finally relaxed. The man bitterly remarked, And it's very bad that you've stepped back from the business because the situation in the firm is getting worse. I can't reach Morgan. He doesn't listen to me. He's hanging around with this lowlife, our new cleaner. He's even planning to marry her. It's laughable. He's neglecting his work. The profits are dropping. I don't know what to do. I wanted to consult with you. Maybe you can influence Morgan somehow? The elderly businessman frowned. What's going on there? Come on, tell me everything in detail. Nicholas joyfully recounted everything, rubbing his hands quite satisfied. Now, surely, the father would make Morgan leave Maggie. And rightly so, she deserved it. After the conversation with his employee, Carl immediately stormed into the company and quarreled fiercely with his son. Son, have you gone mad? What do you need this mess for? Or are decent girls out of fashion? Come on, stop fooling around and get your act together. I reviewed the reports. The profits are non-existent. What's the matter? Morgan also got offended and stood firm. Don't you dare call Maggie a mess. She's wonderful. We're getting married soon, and she won't work as a cleaner anymore. She'll be my wife. Maggie will give you grandchildren soon. I know there are difficulties in the company, and I'm trying to figure it out. Don't worry. I'll try to fix everything. Or do you not trust me anymore? I don't understand. And don't lecture me like I'm a schoolboy. Dad, I've long grown up and have the right to my own opinion and my own life. Carl hoped that his son would listen to his words. But it didn't happen. The couple continued to meet and prepare for the celebration. Moreover, the girl was already pregnant. She now lived with Morgan in the mansion as the mistress and didn't work. Carl was angry and outraged. He considered this pauper a gold digger. She appeared out of nowhere and was now the wife of a businessman. No, he couldn't allow this. She wasn't the bride he dreamed of. And then Nicholas volunteered to help. Together they devised a plan to permanently separate the couple. But the cunning employee went even further and secretly sold their developments to competitors. It hit the company's image and wallet hard, and now they were truly in dire straits. All these troubles forced the couple to postpone the wedding preparations. But soon another misfortune struck, shaking Maggie. A neighbor from the village called and informed her that her grandfather had passed away suddenly. She needed to go to the funeral. The girl was crying. They hadn't seen each other since she left for the capital. She felt guilty about his death. He clearly suffered from her departure, and now he passed away. Morgan also sympathized with the situation, gave money for the funeral, paid for everything, but couldn't go himself. And the clouds over the company thickened, there seemed to be no way out. After the funeral, Maggie returned to the city, crestfallen and sad, she didn't care about anything. She also suffered from terrible morning sickness. Everything made her nauseous. She thought Morgan would be happy about the baby, but when he found out there would be three of them, his eyes popped out. Triplets? Is this a joke? 
There have never been triplets in our family. I'm just shocked. I don't even know if I should be happy or cry over such news. This strange reaction from her fiancé unsettled the girl. She felt uneasy. Yes, his ardor toward her immediately cooled down. Morgan hadn't expected such consequences. Plus, things were getting worse at the firm. His father was furious and soon handed over the reins to Nicholas. He called his son a puppet and incompetent. All these scandals completely shattered Morgan's psyche. He became jittery and angry. He and Maggie started to argue over trivial matters frequently. He looked at her growing belly not with excitement but with dread, wondering what he would do with three children at once. But that wasn't all the hardships that suddenly befell Maggie. If only she knew what trap vengeful Nicholas would set for her. Maggie comforted herself as best she could. She strengthened herself, tried to smooth out the rough edges, and hoped that all these troubles were temporary. The most important thing was that she and Morgan loved each other, and that meant they would overcome everything. In which family does everything go smoothly anyway? That evening, she busied herself in the kitchen, waiting for Morgan to come home from work. She cooked dumplings with cherries, just the way he liked them, set the table. Dreamily rubbing her huge belly, she talked to her babies. Look, my little ones will be born soon, and then we'll have our wedding. But now, our daddy has so many problems, there's no time for celebration. But Grandpa Carl will melt as soon as he sees you and will love you. Oh, it's a pity my favorite grandpa didn't live to see his grandchildren. He would have been so happy for me. And I already love you, my darlings. Then the key turned in the lock, and Morgan burst into the apartment, reeking of alcohol. He was furious, his eyes bloodshot, this had never happened before. Maggie was even scared. Darling, what's wrong with you? Are you drunk? Did something happen? You're looking at me like that. Don't scare me, please. I'm even scared. Suddenly, Morgan threw a pack of photos at her face and yelled. You're such a scoundrel. Here, take a look. Have you been cheating on me all along? And the kids, are they his? Don't you know that I had swine flu as a child? My father says I probably can't have children at all. Aren't you ashamed, Maggie? I loved you so much. And Nicholas told me you were two-faced and flirted with him too. I, fool, didn't believe it. The bewildered woman looked through the photos and couldn't understand anything. Here she was walking arm in arm with some unknown man. Here she was kissing him. Here she was getting into a car. She screamed until she was hoarse. What nonsense is this? It's not me. Can't you understand? You're the only man I've ever been with. Besides you, I've had no one else. Why don't you believe me? Look at me. I'm at home all day. Where would I find men? I don't know who this man in the photos is. Why don't you believe me? She wanted to hug him, look into his eyes, but he pushed her away roughly. Get out of the house. You disgust me. I can't stand to see you. Maggie felt so hurt, so much pain. She burst into tears and went to pack her things. Morgan didn't stop her just sat in the kitchen, drinking brandy and waiting for her to slam the front door behind her. She hoped until the last moment that he would change his mind, that he would stop her, that he would say he loved her. But he didn't even turn around. It turns out, he didn't care that she was pregnant, that she had nowhere to go. To hell with his children. None of this made sense to Maggie. It seemed like madness, a monstrous mistake. In a burst of emotion, the poor woman decided to sever all ties with Morgan and return to the village. And start over, raising the children herself. Throughout the journey on the train, she cried, tears choking her, 
and inside, she boiled with resentment. After all, her beloved had thrown her out like a mongrel. It was so scary. She had loved him so unconditionally, been faithful, never cheated. And only now, sitting on her grandfather's couch, did Maggie realize the full horror of her situation. Indeed, how would she live here alone? With three children, without a penny and any conveniences. No children's things, nothing at all. No strollers, no cribs, no baby baths. Money was also tight, maybe enough for a month, or even less. And then what? How would she raise three babies on her own? Even thinking about it was unbearable. She suddenly looked at her grandfather's portrait and wailed. You warned me, Grandpa. You tried to dissuade me from going to the city, felt the trouble. But I, silly me, didn't listen. Grandpa, dear, if you knew how bad I feel and you're not here. You would have scolded me out of decency and forgiven me, helped me, not left me in a difficult moment. Why did you leave so early for heaven? Why did you leave me? She whispered all this out loud, as if in a delirium, tears streaming from her eyes. She was in complete despair and didn't know how to go on living. From worry and stress, Maggie felt very unwell. Her head spun, her stomach ached terribly. She collapsed sideways on the couch and writhed in pain, overcome by wild panic. Lord, has it really begun? This is the last thing I needed right now. What should I do? Where's my phone? Who should I call? The ambulance will take at least an hour and a half to arrive. Oh, it hurts so much. Lord, don't abandon me in this difficult moment. Help me. I beg you. She shouted all this out loud, biting her lips, sometimes losing consciousness, sometimes briefly regaining it. And suddenly she saw someone's silhouette and felt large, warm, rough hands. A pleasant baritone whispered to her, Don't be afraid, I'll help you. I know how to deliver babies. Let me examine you, please, otherwise I won't be able to help you. Maggie mumbled, Who are you? How do you know what to do? Am I dying, huh? Or, Hey, don't come near me. I won't let you kill my children. Don't touch me. She resisted and screamed. She was beside herself. She couldn't tell if this was a nightmare or reality. Everything merged into one huge ball of pain and suffering. But soon it wasn't contractions anymore, but the urge to push, and the woman didn't care anymore who wanted what from her. She arched her back and screamed hysterically. After that, she vaguely remembered everything, as if in a dream. Someone wiped her forehead with cool water, gave her a drink, gave her clear commands, and even slapped her cheeks a couple of times when she was completely incoherent or lost consciousness. Surprisingly, the woman followed their instructions, and soon she heard the long-awaited cry of her babies. And then she fell back into oblivion. Maggie came to when someone held smelling salts under her nose. She even flinched and immediately came to her senses. The mother of three didn't know how much time had passed. She barely regained consciousness. Paramedics from the ambulance team leaned over her. Ma'am, can you hear me? We received an emergency call about urgent childbirth at your address, but we took a long time to get here. The journey wasn't short, and the roads were terrible. Please forgive us. As we can see, everything has already happened. You successfully delivered triplets on your own, which can only be called a miracle. The babies are fine too. You have three girls, just a little underweight. But you lost a lot of blood. But it's not surprising given such complicated childbirth. We'll take you to the maternity hospital now. The doctor will examine you. Tell us, who managed to deliver the triplets so professionally? It's a talent. 
at home, without any equipment or conditions. I would like to shake hands with this hero. Not every experienced obstetrician gynecologist could handle such a task. Maggie hugged her babies and whispered, I don't know, I hardly remember anything. I just got here, haven't even unpacked my things, and it started. And then I lost consciousness and didn't remember his face. I don't even understand how a stranger could be here. It's my grandfather's old house, nobody lived in it before me. It's a mystery. But I'm very grateful to my savior, whoever he may be. I would have surely died alone. The paramedic and the doctor couldn't believe their eyes. The babies were washed, wrapped in blankets, and the mother was also in perfect order. So who is this hero? Maggie was taken to the maternity ward in the city. The doctor examined her and confirmed that everything was done very professionally. She just needed to lie down for a week and regain some strength, keep an eye on the children. After all, their weight was a little low. All week Maggie was very nervous. There wasn't enough milk. She had to supplement the babies. She rocked her little ones, her beloved girls, and cried from both joy and sorrow at the same time. She was tormented by thoughts. How am I going to go home from the maternity hospital alone? You can't carry three babies. And how embarrassing. Alone, without a husband, I gave birth to three. I can imagine how people will look at me. Even representatives of the social service talked to the new mother, indirectly hinting that she wouldn't manage to raise three children on her own. There's no one to help her, no husband, no parents, no relatives. Maybe she could leave one child, and the others could stay in the orphanage for a while. These well-groomed women looked at her as if she were crazy with pity and disgust. Maggie stood her ground. I'll take all three of them, I'll manage. There's a house, there's a garden, I'll run the household, we'll make it. And I won't abandon my children, I'm a mother, not a cuckoo. And don't look at me like that. Yes, I'm a single mother. Yes, with triplets in my arms. But I'm not an alcoholic or a party girl. I love my babies, and I won't give them to anyone. Got it? And don't come to me anymore with such suggestions. Then the women changed tactics, feeling sorry for her, and began to explain and tell her where Maggie should go to get assistance as an underprivileged single mother. After all, a little money will come in regularly. Out of desperation, she even thought of calling Morgan, telling him he was already a father, that he now had three wonderful princesses, Molly, Tiffany, and Sylvana. But she immediately recoiled. How dare she? He threw her away, discarded her like a rag. If he wanted to come back, he would have called long ago. She didn't need him. She needed to erase him from her mind, from her heart, and forget about him. So, the day of discharge has come. Representatives from the city hall also visited her. They gave her wonderful envelopes, diapers, and a stroller for the triplets. Maggie was pacing around in the ward. She couldn't bring herself to say that no one was there to meet her. It was so embarrassing and awkward. There were lots of cars in the courtyard. Relatives honked their horns, taking photos of the happy parents. Finally, Maggie timidly stepped out onto the porch, looking around as if searching for someone. Suddenly, a stranger ran up to her, short, cheerful, with freckles. He was dressed simply, with old jeans and a t-shirt, but clean. He briskly said to the nurse, I'm here for Maggie, give me the children. Well, darling, what are you standing there for? Are you lost? No wonder. I barely made it, forgive me. Get in the taxi, it's time to go home. He handed her a modest bouquet of peonies, but Maggie was grateful even for that. Now no one was staring at her, everyone was sincerely clapping, congratulating, and wishing the family happiness. 
and as they were already driving in the taxi, the bewildered woman asked, Thank you, of course, but who are you? We don't know each other. Why did you come for me? Did Morgan send you? The man shook his head. I don't know any Morgan. My name is Simon. I was the one who delivered your babies. It just happened. The house had been empty for a long time, and I gradually settled in, tired of wandering. And then you unexpectedly came. I got scared and hid. But when everything started, there was no time to think. I saved you. It seems everything worked out. My hands knew what to do on their own, although I was very nervous after all these years of break. Maggie felt even more embarrassed, and she sincerely thanked him. So you're my savior. Thank you, Simon, from the bottom of my heart. If it weren't for you, I would have surely died there. Are you a doctor? Everyone at the maternity ward was amazed at how professionally everything was done. They even wanted to shake your hand. How did it happen that such talent goes unnoticed? Simon sighed and began to tell, the road to the village was still long. Now I'm a vagabond, but I used to be the only and beloved son in a wealthy family. My childhood was very happy. My parents took care of me. There was nothing they wouldn't do for me. My dad was just happy that I became a medic. I worked as an emergency doctor. I loved this job. You know, knowing that every day wasn't in vain, and you, even if one person, saved from death, helped to stand on their feet. Then I met Esther. She was also a medic, worked as a nurse in the hospital. I fell in love with her with all my heart. We were getting ready for the wedding. But then Esther's parents unexpectedly fell ill, and my dad volunteered to take her himself. I happened to be on duty at the time. It was snowstorm and freezing rain outside, such nasty weather. This trip turned out to be fatal. They skidded at the intersection. Dad couldn't handle the car and crashed into a pole. They both died in that accident, and my mom couldn't bear it either. She died of a heart attack three months later. It was hell, funerals and memorials everywhere. And I stood by the coffin and couldn't comprehend what had happened. My brain refused to believe that Esther was gone and would never be back. And you know, competitors never sleep. They immediately took over the company, like vultures swooping down, and I found myself in a huge trap. And I broke down, started drinking heavily. It was easier for me that way. It allowed me to relieve mental suffering and forget for a couple of hours. I didn't care about anything. I closed my eyes and saw Esther laughing, my mom calling me for dinner, and dad reading the newspaper on his favorite couch. It was unbearable. I was fired from my job, and creditors took our house for debts. That's how I became a homeless person. I know, it's not manly. I should have pulled myself together, fought to the end. But I didn't see the point, you understand? I lost all my relatives at once. If only the family business had remained, maybe, in memory of my father, I would have struggled. But as it is, don't be angry with me for deciding to take you from the maternity hospital. Don't worry, I earned the money for the taxi honestly. I helped an old lady chop a whole pile of firewood and stacked it. I just felt so sorry for you. How could this happen? You're alone, and then childbirth, and no one around. That shouldn't happen. I just couldn't stand aside. After all, I once swore by Hippocrates. I didn't touch anything in the house, didn't steal anything. Don't worry, I just slept there for the night. Maggie couldn't help but cry. And she didn't even notice how she told him everything about herself, about the scoundrel fiancé, and how she was thrown out like a mischievous kitten. And in the end, she added, You know, Simon, let's switch to you. We're practically family. I'm not angry at all. On the contrary, I'm very grateful to you for everything. 
You're the only one who, by fate's will, saved my babies and me. And also, I'll be glad if you stay. Stay as long as you want. Honestly, I'm so scared to stay alone with the triplets because the house needs to be cleaned. And in general, any help would be useful to me right now. So, Simon ended up staying with Maggie. He wasn't idle. He fixed the roof, the fence, and rebuilt the stove. Before, he was afraid of attracting attention, didn't touch anything here. But this man desperately wanted to help this brave woman who dared to give birth to triplets alone. At first, the neighbors condemned Maggie, looked down on her. Well, she arrived pregnant, gave birth, who knows from whom disgraceful. And she got mixed up with a bum. But the local policeman, who visited Maggie, was delighted. He had known Maggie since childhood, but he had a long conversation with Morgan. He was supposed to check new arrivals in the village. He checked the man's documents, asked questions. He didn't lie or evade, and told his whole life as it was, he had nothing to hide. The policeman checked the information, everything checked out, and he suggested to Morgan to work as a paramedic in the local clinic. The old doctor had been retired for a long time, and people needed somewhere to get treatment. The man gladly agreed, now he felt responsible for Maggie and the kids. And he was very happy that he could now somehow support them. In the evenings, Simon stubbornly tinkered in the barn, but Maggie was so exhausted with household chores and taking care of the children that she had no leisure to watch. But when one day he brought three charming wooden cradles into the house, she just exclaimed, Good heavens! This is beauty! Your hands are pure gold. You made them yourself. Well, I never. Thank you so much, and here I am worrying that the babies will fall off the couch. You're such a gem, Simon. Someone's really lucky. You're the kind of husband one can only dream of. The man was embarrassed. He appreciated her compliments, her warm words. And suddenly he replied, you know, Maggie, after Esther's death, my life ended, stopped, and there was a huge black hole in my soul that I couldn't fill. And now you and the kids are in my fate. I'm very happy about that. Let me always be there to help you. That's the best reward for me. You are the meaning of my life now. I now know why to get up in the morning, what to strive for, and what to do. I understand you feel embarrassed because people talk all sorts of nonsense. But I know you are the best woman in the world. Maggie confidently replied, Yes, let them talk. They'll talk and then stop. The main thing is that we're together. We need each other. And the rest isn't so important. I'm glad and grateful to fate that you're with me now, and every day I feel your support. It's priceless, believe me. Time passed, and the attitude of the villagers gradually began to change. Now they ran to Morgan for help, someone to measure blood pressure, someone to give injections, someone to treat sciatica. He never refused anyone. If necessary, he got up at night and went to help. Simon was a professional in his field. He could even recognize dangerous illnesses and timely send villagers to the city for examination. As a sign of gratitude, people brought various gifts from the heart, eggs, honey, or a piece of bacon. Many shared vegetables from their garden and pickles. And Maggie's life gradually improved. There was something to cook for lunch. They no longer went hungry. Neighbor Aunt Laura helped her manage her daughters, often watching over them so that the woman could at least get some sleep or do some housework. Familiar Uncle Daryl brought cages and a couple of rabbits for breeding. There was plenty of grass. Mo don't want to. Simon gladly started farming. He never seemed to get tired. He enjoyed it all. The man had suffered so much in life that now he enjoyed every day of normal family village life. 
He woke up before dawn, fed the animals, managed things, had breakfast, kissed his Maggie, little chubby sleepy princesses, and rushed to help people. Sometimes he was invited to neighboring villages. After all, rumors about a smart doctor, finally working in the village, quickly spread around the district. Yes, and Maggie felt at home. Even the air here was special, dear. They didn't regret leaving the city for a moment. She, too, finally found something she loved to do. It turned out she was great at cutting hair, although she never really learned. First, she cut Simon's hair, then Uncle Theodore's, then freshened up her own hairstyle. And soon, neighbors started coming to her house. After all, she didn't charge much, she did it more for pleasure and experience. The kids grew up and happily gurgled. They already smiled widely and reached out their little hands, recognizing Simon and chattering to him in their own way. Aunt Laura faithfully brought fresh goat's milk every morning. The kids grew wonderfully on it and didn't get sick. Maggie tried to be an exemplary housewife and looked after the children. Luckily, they were calm and kept each other busy. After all, three is not one and she kept the house clean and always cooked Simon a hot dinner, pleasing him with something tasty, homemade. They may not have lived richly, but they lived together, with peace and love in their hearts. Six months had passed. One cold winter evening, the whole family was having dinner. Simon came home from work, happily devouring cabbage soup from the oven. The fire would crackle cheerfully, and the house was warm and cozy. Suddenly, there was a knock on the window. Simon reluctantly got up. He had barely warmed up from the cold, and now he had to go out again. But Maggie called out to him. You keep eating. I'll open it myself. Probably Uncle Daryl brought a shovel like I asked. Maggie put on her fur coat, slipped on her felt boots, and went to open the door. The blizzard was so fierce you couldn't see a thing. She opened the door and gasped, standing on the doorstep, hunched over from the cold, was Morgan. He muttered unclearly, You've hidden yourself well, Maggie, I could barely find you. Let me in, we need to talk. We can't have this conversation out in the cold. Maggie was trembling, torn between past love and pity. She wanted to slap the scoundrel right there and throw him out. The echoes of their former love mixed with resentment. She silently led him into the porch. He shook the snow off his expensive coat and entered the house. The smell of freshly baked bread and cabbage soup made his mouth water. Simon looked at the uninvited guest in astonishment. Sensing a stranger in the house, the children began to whimper. Simon immediately started to entertain and calm them down, taking turns lifting them up and kissing their chubby, rosy cheeks. They quieted down and settled down. Maggie stood there, folding her arms across her chest, staring intently at Morgan. She didn't offer him a seat, only asked dryly, Well, speak up, what brings you here? Don't think I'm glad to see you. Could it be your conscience bothering you? I'll never believe it. Morgan didn't expect such a negative reaction. He thought Maggie was pining away, waiting for him to return, and they would reconcile immediately. But it wasn't so. There was another man in the house, and that changed everything. So he timidly began. I've come to make amends, Maggie. I was foolish back then. I believed those silly photos, and I kicked you out. Everyone praised me, saying good job. That's what she deserves. A cheating wench, and I believed them. Only a month before his death, my father confessed that it was all a setup. That he and Nicholas orchestrated it all. Nicholas took over my business too, so now I'm out of work. Of course, my father's savings will last me for a while. But you know, I've realized the most important thing, I only need you and our children. 
Nobody else could replace you during this time. I love only you, Maggie. Please come back to me. Maggie was astonished by his words. His audacity shocked her. Inside, she was boiling with anger. Can you even hear yourself? You threw me out on the last month of my pregnancy, just onto the street. Knowing that I was carrying three children, that I had nowhere to go. And you didn't even bat an eye. And now you're talking about love? This man here saved me, by pure chance being nearby. If it weren't for him, both I and the children would have died. Do you understand that? Look at him closely. His name is Simon. He's not rich or a businessman, just a simple paramedic. But that's what a real man looks like. At least to me. Love, Morgan, is not just pretty words or bunches of roses you used to give me. It's sincere care, human warmth, and trust. When you truly love someone, you believe in them unconditionally. I don't love you anymore, and I don't believe you. Do you hear me? I can never forgive you for your betrayal. That's it. Leave. The conversation is over. At this point, Simon intervened. His eyes were burning, and his hands were shaking. So you're Morgan? Maggie's former fiancé and the father of her children? What a meeting. The world is so small. Don't you recognize me? Of course not. It was your father who took the construction contract away from my company. I remember you all too well. What a family. One profited from people's misery and death, the other threw his pregnant beloved woman out to certain doom. Now I'm not surprised. I can expect anything from you too. Morgan paled and didn't know where to look. It was all true, and there was nothing to hide. He played his last card. Maggie, come to your senses. What about our children? Will they grow up without a father? Come on, replace your anger with mercy. We're almost a family. Haven't you forgotten how good we were together? He was about to approach the playpen where the quiet girls were sitting. But Maggie, like a wolf, lunged forward and pushed Morgan towards the exit. Don't you dare go near the children. Got it? What kind of father are you to them? Six months have passed, and now you suddenly remember them? And before that, you weren't interested in their fate? Go away. Get out. The children have the best father already. He loves them and cares for them. Not like you. Forget the way here. You're not a man. You're nothing. Remember that. Morgan stormed out of the house, feeling scalded, humiliated, and crushed. He immediately remembered how he had chased Maggie away, how she cried and begged him to reconsider. And he had shouted obscenities at her. How ashamed he felt now. I've lost everything because of my own fault, listened to everyone but my own heart. And what now? What am I left with? No business, no family, a complete zero. What lovely girls they are. And their eyes are as brown as his. And their little brows furrowed just like his did in childhood. How could this happen? They'll call him Daddy Simon now. They'll love him. And me? What about me? Is this the end? The man got into his car, buried his head in his hands, and screamed. Lord, what a bastard I am. I deserve this. I don't even know my daughter's names. Poor Maggie. Why was I so blind, so deaf, as if possessed by a demon? I blindly believed my father. Nicholas, like a snake, whispered nasty things about Maggie in my ear. But besides her, no one ever loved me, cared for me like she did. I must atone for my sin. Even if I lost Maggie, even if she doesn't love me anymore, I owe it to the children to help them somehow. Otherwise, there's no point in living. 
After Morgan left, Maggie couldn't hold back her tears, but now they were tears of cleansing, and with each tear, the resentment and hatred towards Morgan faded away. She finally expressed everything she had been holding inside, and it felt much lighter. Simon approached and gently embraced her. Do you regret leaving? Do you still love him? Please, tell me honestly. It's important for me to understand. What am I to you, a friend? You said such warm words about me to your ex. Do you really mean that? Or were you just trying to hurt him more? I never expected I could feel such intense jealousy. Yes, Maggie, I'm jealous of you. And I'm afraid to think that you might go back to him, especially since you have children together. So, please, tell me now if that's the case, don't torture me. Maggie replied very seriously, looking into his eyes. No, Simon, I said what I meant. You're the closest, the most beloved person to me. I don't need anyone else. I just got so angry when I saw Morgan, when he wanted to approach the children. Bad memories flooded back, you know. On one hand, I even feel sorry for him, he wasn't always like this. We loved each other deeply, or at least I thought so. But the way he treated me and our little ones showed me how wrong I was about him. If Morgan truly loved me, he would never have acted so cruelly. I don't need his money. Happiness doesn't lie in that. Let us live modestly with you. So what? I have much more now, a strong, loving family, and my soul feels so good and calm. And my beloved grandfather was right when he often said, where you're born is where you're useful. The man almost cried, holding Maggie even tighter, whispering. Thank you for accepting me, for believing. For loving a worthless wanderer. I promise, I'll do everything to ensure you and our girls lack nothing. And I want everything to be real between us. Let's get married officially at the registry office and become real husband and wife. But you can't hide anything in a small village. As soon as the villagers found out that Maggie and Simon had filed their marriage papers, the whole street exclaimed, Why, young ones, are you holding back on the wedding? That's not how we do things here. We must celebrate properly, wish happiness to the newlyweds. It's such an event, after all. Maggie blushed and replied quietly. Yes, we wouldn't mind, but we don't have much money. Not enough for a big celebration. We can't even afford to go to a cafe in the district center, so we decided to just register our marriage. Uncle Darrell slapped his knee. Well, have you heard, good people, we've found a problem. Why do we need those cafes, restaurants, and taverns? We have our own club in the village. We'll set up tables and benches, and everyone will bring something from home. That's how we'll celebrate. I'll bring my accordion. We'll throw such a wedding that any restaurant would envy. Simon supported. You know, Maggie, it's a good idea. We should respect people. It didn't feel right otherwise. Ah, what a celebration it will be. The celebration was a great success. The whole village gathered. They decorated the club with balloons, posters, and the tables were overflowing with homemade sausages and treats. They had such a good, heartfelt time. They took turns babysitting the children. The local kids were excited to play with three identical little girls. And then they danced, sang soulful, touching songs, and their souls flew somewhere far away. It's no wonder they say that all villagers are like one big family. And just like in any family, there are scandals, gossip, and misunderstandings. But when trouble arises, they rush to help shoulder to shoulder. This is what distinguishes simple, heartfelt villagers from city dwellers whose only priority is their own interests. And Maggie felt at home in her native village where everything was so simple and clear. 
Everything was familiar from childhood, the fields, the meadows, the clean little river. And there's no place sweeter in the world than one's own home. Even the hard couches there feel soft to sleep on. It was here that the woman found her feminine happiness, which she had never found in the terribly bustling, beautiful, but alien city. And she was so grateful to fate that everything turned out just like this. The next day, the postman Tatiana knocked on Maggie's door, waving some papers. Maggie, open up, you've got an urgent letter. Here you go. Phew, I'm out of breath. Could I get some water? Maggie gestured for her to come inside, brought out a glass of water, and then began to read the letter with concentration. My dearest Maggie, you are right. I am a scoundrel and a wretch, and I don't deserve forgiveness. And I have brought this upon myself. That's why I've decided to leave the country, far away, abroad. Maybe I'm running away from myself, I don't know. I'll try to find my happiness there. I've been thinking for a long time, reminiscing about our relationship, reproaching myself for cowardice and treachery, and I really wish I could turn back time. To look into your happy, sparkling eyes with that twinkle and catch your smile, so naive and so sincere. But alas, it's impossible. And I also saw how you looked at the other one, Simon. With the same tenderness and love as you once looked at me. I sincerely wish you happiness and I won't interfere. I won't be the third wheel. It turns out, due to my stupidity, I don't even know my daughter's names. It's terrible. It's shameful for me as their father. Maggie, Simon will raise them better than me. I don't want to torment the children, torn between their biological father, who feels like a stranger now, and their stepfather, who loves them, and make them oscillate back and forth. Nothing good will come of it. But before saying goodbye forever, I want to do something good for my children. So... Here's my farewell gift. A safety deposit box has been opened for you at the branch on Bolvarnea Street. The code is 5583. Please accept with wisdom, not with malice, what's inside. I beg you, for the sake of our little ones. Farewell. Your once beloved, Morgan. And Maggie cried again, realizing that at this very moment, Morgan was letting her go and she was letting him go too. From now on, the story of their lives had closed forever. The next day, Maggie and Simon went to the city to the bank, where they were given the contents of that safety deposit box. They opened it and gasped. Inside were three golden crosses and a stack of money. And a note for my daughters from their wayward father. Be happy. Simon whistled and said thoughtfully, a noble gesture. Seems like Morgan's conscience has finally awakened. It's worthy of respect. We'll put the crosses on the little ones. After all, they have the right to know who their father is. But we don't need the money. What should we do with it? Maggie thought for a moment and replied. How about we open a savings account in the girls' names? When they grow up, It'll be a gift from their father, something useful. And we'll manage just fine without it, right? And so they did, leaving the bank with pure hearts. On the way, they stopped by the church, blessed the crosses, prayed for the health of the living, and lit candles for the souls of deceased loved ones. Maggie mentally let go of Morgan and even wished him happiness. Surprisingly, she felt lighter. As if a heavy, unbearable burden had been lifted from her soul. And Simon fervently prayed for himself that his long-awaited family happiness would never end. After all, both he and Maggie had earned it. 